Hi, and welcome to video two of three on chapter 10. Now, last video, we discussed uh, some of the basics of rotational motion. Uh, and I showed you that uh, equationally, it looks roughly the same as one dimensional motion, which is very convenient. So in reality, you're not really learning anything new per se, other than the fact that you can rotate and also translate. The equations look the same. All you have to do is to do a change of variable. Now, that said, today what I want to start off with is uh, a discussion about kinetic energy. Uh, if you remember, um, way back when, we talked about kinetic energy. <clears throat> and we know translational kinetic energy looks like one-half mv squared. Now, again, be clear, or to be clear, rather, you know, you're starting off at point A, you're ending up at point B, and as you go from here to here, the V here, that's the V here. So this is translational. Now, that said, uh, when you have something that rotates about a point in space, it also has rotational kinetic energy, too. So, for example, if you had um, a rod swinging around in a circle as it goes like this, you have the kinetic energy associated with this point A to point B motion, but you also have the kinetic energy that's associated with the object rotating. Okay, remember, kinetic energy is energy in motion, and rotation is a type of motion. So I want you to think of a composite object, kind of like what we uh, started our discussion with, um, you know, last time. And uh, so here it is. Um, it's going to be, you know, we'll say three things just to be convenient here. You know, all linked by, um, you know, uh, massless rods. Here's Y, here's X. And, you know, maybe this thing is rotating this way, you know, in a positive angular direction. So I'm going to call this M1 and it is R1 away from our point of rotation here. This is M2, uh, it is R2 away, and this here is M3, which is R3 away. So as this thing rotates, uh, you know, these masses are moving around in circles, and as a consequence of that, uh, they have kinetic energy. Okay, so if you were to look at the kinetic energy that they have just from rotating, the total kinetic energy would be the kinetic energy of the first one plus the kinetic energy of the second one plus the kinetic energy of the third one, which would be one-half m1 v1 squared plus one-half m2 v2 squared plus one-half m3 v3 squared. Now, uh, however, if you remember our conversation last time, um, v is point A to point B type velocity. And when it comes to rotations, um, the easiest thing that we can deal with would be angular stuff. But we do know a, re a relationship between tangential velocity, which is what this is, and rotational velocity. And that is that V is equal to R times omega. Okay, so V1 would be R1 times omega. V2 would be R2 times omega, and V3 would be R3 times omega. And the omegas are all the same because, you know, whereas they may spatially take, you know, different paths as they go around, they all take the same path through angles, okay? So if I were to plug this right here into the equation that we have here, I'd have one-half M1 R1 omega squared plus one-half M2 R2 omega squared plus one-half M3 R3 omega squared. Now, what I want to do here is to pull the half out of all of these terms and put it in the front. And then I'm going to have a bunch of stuff here. This is going to be a sum in parenthesis. And then I'm going to pull the omega squared out of these and put it in the back. The reason why I'm doing this is because kinetic energy looks like one half times mass times the velocity squared. What we have here is one half times something times an angular velocity squared. 
So whatever this is right here is going to act like mass. It's not going to exactly be mass. We're going to see why here in a moment. But it's going to act like mass when it comes to rotations. Okay. And what's left behind is this. M1, R1 squared, plus M2, R2 squared, plus M3, R3 squared. Now, this is a sum. Okay. And generally, the way we write this is the following. I, which I'm going to name here in a moment, is the sum from 1 to n, n being the number of masses that we have, times m sub i, r sub i squared. Now this is called the moment of inertia. Now, this is also one of the reasons why, way back when, when I talked about Newton's laws, I said that one way you can think of mass is that it's the amount of material that sits within something. But a more appropriate way is to think about it as inertia. Here is an example of why. This gives you a sense of how much resistance is offered by something when you try to change its rotational motion. So it behaves like mass, or more appropriately, like inertia. Now, that said, what I want to do now is to examine it. Okay. The first thing we see here is that you have mass. That's understandable, because, I mean, this deals with inertia. But more interestingly, your moment of inertia depends upon how far away your mass is from a point of rotation, specifically an axis of rotation. Because if you think about this being X and this being Y, Z here would be out of the screen towards you, and it rotates about that axis. So in this case, Z would be the axis of rotation. Now, I'm going to do an example um, real quick showing you about moment of inertia, and then later on we're going to revisit kinetic energy. But I did want to show you that if you take and you write this as I, now you have rotational kinetic energy, which I'm going to call K sub theta, and it looks like one half I omega squared. So if you remember that table that we had made uh, last lecture where I showed that, you know, uh, for translation in 1D, displacement is delta x for translation in rotations is delta theta and how all the equations look the same except you have to make this this trans this uh, change of variable if you will um, it's the same here uh, the thing that acts like velocity for rotations is omega the thing that acts like mass for rotations is i okay so the equations look the same it's going to be true all the way through uh, the end of uh, our discussion about rotational motion now uh, that said, this is your first big uh, new concept. Okay, this is your first big new one. Now, like I said, we're going to come back to this here in a moment. Uh, and we're going to talk about the, the continuous way of writing this. This is the discrete way because you deal with individual masses uh, of which you have n. But we know that when you have enough masses um, that you need to extend this to uh, calculus. Uh, and we're going to do that here in a moment. But before I do that... Uh, what I'd like to do is to, to do a moment of inertia calculation to show you how it behaves because it's very, because it's a new concept. It's something that you have to put some time in on. Okay. So uh, remember the equation for a moment of inertia is you sum up all the masses uh, times how far away from the point of rotation they are. Okay. That's the critical thing. Okay. So uh, what we have here are two configurations of rotation. Uh, in the first one, you have a massless rod that has two masses sitting on the end, and they're rotating about the x-axis at the center point. Over here, now you have the same massless rod, okay, except instead of rotating about the center point, it's rotating about the center of mass one. Now we're going to assume, just for the sake of this problem, 
that both mass one and mass two are points. So they don't have any substance to them. They're not spheres or something like that. They're just points in space. But later on, we're going to see what we need to do when we do have actual structure like a sphere. Okay. So um, let's, let's calculate I for, for the A to begin with. Okay. And if you look here, uh, M1 is two and a half kilograms. M2 is three kilograms. So this is, you know, 2.5 kilograms. This is three kilograms. And let me just go ahead and transpose that over here. Uh, 2.5 kilograms and uh, three kilograms here. So if I wanted to calculate the moment of inertia here for, for, for A, um, it's a sum. Since we only have two masses here, uh, it would be M1 R1 squared plus M2 R2 squared. So um, M1 is two and a half kilograms. R1 is the distance that M1 is away from the point of rotation. Okay. So here it's three meters. M2, three kilograms. R2 is the distance that M2 is away from the point of rotation. Again, three meters. Now, if you calculate this, let me grab my calculator. 2.5 times 3 squared plus 3 times 3 squared. You get 49 and a half. Now, the units are weird. They're kilogram meter squareds, and there's really no way to simplify those. All right. So this is this is the amount of quote unquote mass that this thing resists you with whenever you take and you rotate this thing around. Okay. Now let's compare it to um, this arrangement here for B. So the moment of inertia for B would be M1 R1 squared plus M2 R2 squared. But look, take a look at R1 here. R1 is the distance that M1 is away from the point of rotation or the axis of rotation. The axis of rotation is right here. So uh, R1 here is zero, which means that here, that contributes nothing to resisting you trying to change this motion. On the other hand, you have M2, which is three kilograms. And then you have R2, which is six meters. So um, you do that, you get 108. So what I'd like to point out here is that in both cases, it's the same object, okay? But it's rotating about a different point. And that, as a consequence, causes it to resist you trying to change its motion as it rotates in different ways. And if you think of this as mass, in this configuration, it acts like it has more mass than in this configuration. Now, what does that mean? Well, at some point, which will be the next video, we're going to talk about torque. And torque is the thing for rotation that acts like force. We know from our understanding of Newton's laws that when you apply a force to something that has mass, it experiences acceleration. If you think of this as mass, and we think of torque as angular force, then when you, if you were to apply the same amount of torque in both situations, because this one has less mass, it would experience more angular acceleration this way than this way. Okay. So, like I said, it's a new concept because it involves how the mass is distributed around a point of rotation. But otherwise, it, it behaves exactly the same. Okay. Now, so, that said, 
Now what I'd like to do is to talk about what happens whenever you have something that is not a discrete series of objects, but a continuum. Okay. So in that situation, now remember for discrete, our moment of inertia looks like this. So this is discrete. For a continuous arrangement of mass, our moment of inertia becomes an integral of r squared dm. And this integral may or may not be easy to calculate. Okay. Um, so um, to that point, um, because there are many, many, many common things that we rotate in physics or just in reality. If you look on your book in page 497, there is a list of moments of inertia for a whole bunch of different objects. Okay. These are all continuous objects. For example, you have a hoop about a cylinder axis. The hoop would be rotating this way and the axis would go straight through the center. You have an annular cylinder. What that means is it's like a hoop, except now it's thick. Okay. So rotating about the central axis, you have a cylinder rotating about a central axis. You have a solid cylinder that's rotating about the axis this way. So look, this is rotating this way and this is rotating this way. And as you can see, the moments of inertia look different. Here's a thin rod. By thin rod, that means that you basically dis disregard the thickness of it and you just look at its length. Again, rotating about a central point or rotating about the end. And as you can see, the moments of inertia are different. The same thing goes for a sphere. If you have a sphere and it, any line goes to the center, any, any axis of rotation goes to the center, it looks like this because of the sym symmetry of the sphere. A shell, though, if it's, if it's a hollow shell, it looks different. Okay, that's because of where the mass is distributed with respect to the point of rotation. Again, if you take the same hoop here, and instead of rotating about the center, you put a line through the center and you rotate it that way like this, you'll notice that the moment of inertia, the moment of inertia looks different. And finally, you have a slab that's basically infinitesimally thin, if you want to think of it, but it has the dimensions of A uh, and, and B. This is what its moment of inertia is going to look like. Okay, so when you're reading a problem and you're trying to figure out, okay, so, you know, uh, what's going on here? Um, uh, you can pick your moments of inertia right out of the book if that's what's required. Okay, or you can calculate them. I'm going to do an example of calculating one. Actually, I'm going to do two uh, using, whoops, uh, this, this form right here. Just to show you how it's done. For those of you that are wanting to go off and do engineering or something like that, uh, you may end up doing lots of moment of inertia calculations when you take statics. Uh, I'm not an engineer. I'm not entirely sure, but that's where I would place it. All right. So that said, um, the first example I'd like to do is something that we already know the answer to. The reason why is because I want to show you that it does, in fact, work. Okay. And that's a hoop about a cylinder axis. So here we have a hoop, okay, that we would like to rotate about the z-axis coming straight out of the, the screen, okay? So there's your axis of rotation right here. The hoop has a radius of r and a mass of m. Now, um, so the moment of inertia from an integral standpoint looks like r squared dm. Okay, now dm is basically where the mass is, if you want to think of it like that. So, so here, if you think about walking around this hoop, what you're doing is you're walking around a circumference. Okay, and we know uh, that the relationship between, let me fix that S, walking along the arc of a hoop, the radius of that hoop, and the angle looks like this. 
Now, that said, um, from chemistry um, or from other places, you may uh, remember density. Now, in physics, we typically talk about three types of densities, um, abbreviated lambda, sigma, and rho. Lambda is density along one dimension or a line. Sigma is density over an area. And rho is density in a volume. Okay, so by density on a line, what I mean is that the mass is distributed over a length. So the units would be kilograms per meter. And in an infinitesimally thin hoop, that's exactly what we have. The entire mass of this thing would be distributed uniformly over the circumference. So what that means is, is that we already know what the, the density of our hoop is. It's the entire mass M distributed over the circumference. Okay, so this is the relationship between the mass and where it's at. So that said, dm would be lambda times ds. Your mass is distributed with this density over this length right here. So what that does is to tell us what our moment of inertia integral is going to look like along a hoop that's infinitesimally thin. It's going to look like r squared lambda ds. Now look, this hoop has a constant radius. The radius doesn't change, which means that if I were to look at what ds is and its relationship to, um, to, to the angle, this is what you would get because R is constant. And since we're using capital R for its radius, this would be capital R times d theta. So my integral here looks like the following. I start walking at an angle of zero. And I walk all the way around to 2 pi. R squared is that. That's where my mass is. This is the density. And this is what I'm integrating over. Now, all this stuff right here is constant, which means that we're just integrating d theta, and we already know how to do that. So we can pull lambda r cubed out, and you're stuck integrating from 0 to 2 pi just d theta. And when you integrate that, you get 2 pi. Now, we're not done yet because this is given to us in terms of a density. And what we'd like to do is to relate it to um, mass, which is what we are given, mass and radius. But like I'd written down earlier, this is the relationship between the mass and the radius right there. So, Lambda is big M over 2 pi times capital R. And then you got an R cubed here. And as you can see, the 2 pi is go away. You're going to lose one factor of R here and make this a 2. Which means that the moment of inertia of a hoop that's thin about a central axis like this is going to be M times R squared. If I were to go back over here and look at the moment of inertia, of a hoop about a central axis, I get mr squared. Okay, so as you can see, this requires a little bit more of a direct approach to applying calculus. All right, now we're going to do another example here. This is a little more complicated. What's the moment of inertia of a uniform rectangular plate of length b and width a that is infinitesimally thin? 
we're going to assume a mass of capital M. Now, we already know what the answer to this is. Again, it's this right here. But let's see if that's what you get. Okay. Now, again, the reason why I want to do this is to illustrate a point. And one important point is this. My R, which is how far away I am from my point of rotation, is this right here. Okay. It's going to sweep out a rectangular shape when I'm trying to calculate it. But it is with respect to this point of rotation. Now, when I'm done working this problem, I'm going to show you the issue of a sphere. We're not going to do the calculation because the calculation is a little bit above the pay grade for this class. But I do want to show you the caveats that you have to deal with when you deal with it. Okay? So, that said, the moment of inertia that we have, we get from calculating the following integral r squared dm. Now that said, this is an area. And if you go back and you look here, the density that we should be considering would be this one right here. This is the mass distributed over an area. So the density, that is how many kilograms per square meter, if you want to think of it like that, that we would have here, would be the mass of this thing over its area. A times B. It's A wide and B long. There you go. Okay. So this is a constant because this is uniformly distributed. All right. What's not a constant is R. R here you get this way. Theta, X, Y, and R. So the relationship between R, X, and Y is this right here. Okay? Now, dm is a lot easier to deal with because it is the density distributed over the area. Okay? Just like over here, we were integrating over a length. Now, because we're dealing with an area, we're integrating over an area. And the area in Cartesian space here is just dx times dy. If we were dealing with more complicated coordinate systems like, say, spherical polar coordinates or even, you know, um, cylindrical coordinates or, you know, um, uh, uniform circular type stuff, um, then, then you would have to adjust appropriately and it'd be a little more complicated. But here, this is what we're dealing with. So, so thankfully, really, our integral that we have to deal with is going to be this. R squared is x squared plus y squared. dm is sigma times dx times dy. Okay? So in reality, we don't have one integral. We're going to be doing two integrals. So we have a double integral here. Now, for those of you that are in, in uh, Calculus 1 right now, or you haven't had Calculus 2, you've seen a little bit of integration. You've never seen integration over two variables. That's okay. You're going to see how it's done here. And I'm not going to really hold you responsible for doing it. Okay? So, uh, but you do need to see that, that it's doable. So that said, um, let's pull that sigma out. And then we're going to look at our limits of integration. The first one I want to say is x. And if you look at x, we go from minus one half a to one half a when we integrate. So this right here on the x axis would be minus one half a. And this one over here would be one half a. For y, this would be minus one half b to one half b. Okay. So the first integral is going to be x. This is going to go from minus one half a to one half a, because that's where our mass is. So the first one's x. The second integral is over y. That's minus one half b to one half b. Okay. What are we integrating? x squared plus y squared. 
dx dy. Now this is actually not only two integrals, but two separate integrals as well, because one's going to be over x squared and one's going to be over y squared. So let's separate those out. The first one we're integrating over would be x squared. Let me put the sigma out over here. Um, x squared dx dy plus y squared dx dy. Now, when you integrate, for example, here over y, um, there are no y's in here to integrate, so you would just get y. If you were to integrate over here, over x, there are no x's in here to integrate, so you would just get x. But here, when you integrate over x, you have, you know, uh, this, this x squared you have to contend with. So I'm going to drop the limits of integration for a moment because they're a little messy. And then I'm going to come back and put them in. And the first thing I want to do is to deal with the x part. So do the x part first. You could do y first. It doesn't matter. So we're going to do x part first. Let me uh, actually get rid of that, make a little bit of room for this. There we go. So if we do, if we integrate this, these two uh, integrals over x first, So this is the one over y. This first one, which I'll call one, and this is two. This I'll say is the first one right here. When you integrate the first one here uh, over x, you're going to get um, one third x cubed. And this one third x cubed is going to be evaluated from minus one half a to one half a. So that's that. But this part belongs to y. So we still have a dy there. Okay. So again, we're just doing the first part right now, or the first one right there. So when you take and you plug in your limits of integration, and let me go ahead and pull that three out because that's a constant. We could pull that out. Okay, so inside here, you would have one half a cubed minus a minus one half a cubed. So that's that. And then you still have dy sitting at the end. Now here's the deal though. Look, um, this is cubed, so that makes it an odd function. So if you have a negative on the inside of an odd function, you can bring the negative out. And when you do, that makes that a plus. Okay, so really what you have here is one-half A cubed plus one-half A cubed. Now, this is just constant, okay? But but if you think about this, when you cube, what's going on in here? Uh, when you cube A, you get A cubed. When you cube one half, you get one eighth. And one eighth plus one eighth would be two eighths or a quarter, okay? And a quarter times a third is a twelfth. That's what you get from all this stuff right here. And since it's a constant, you can pull it out, and now you're stuck just integrating dy. Now, the limits of integration for dy is from minus 1 half b to 1 half b. Okay. So um, you can go ahead and do that if you want. I am. So here you would have y, when you do this integral, evaluated from these two limits right here. And when you take and you plug them in, 
uh, you have one half b minus a uh, minus one half b. Okay, which makes this one half b plus one half b, which is just b. That's just b. Okay, so so here um, the act of just doing the first integral is going to give us sigma over twelve a cubed times b. So this is just the first integral. Now the center, second integral is this one right here that we need to do. And it looks the same as the first, except now you're going over a, or you're going over rather uh, y as opposed to, to x. Uh, that's what's squared in here. So um, let's do that. I'll do it over here. So we're trying to integrate the following thing. And again, I'm going to drop the limits of integration just to make our lives easy. Um, this is y squared dx dy. Okay. Um, you know, you can, you can do whichever one of these you want to do first. Uh, I'll be different this time, and I'll do the x one first. So um, this will say is for y. Um, if you take and you integrate over dx, uh, there are no x's here, which means that you just get x. Uh, x, in this case, is evaluated from minus 1 half a to 1 half a, uh, as usual. Okay, so uh, minus 1 half a to 1 half a. All right. Uh, so, but you still have the y squared. Um, doing a y backwards, what's that all about? Y squared dy that you have to contend with right here. Okay, so... So when you when you actually plug your stuff in here, um, this right here is going to become uh, one half a minus a minus one half a, uh, which we know uh, over here is like what we dealt with would be that's just a. So you can bring that out. That'd be sigma times a, and now you're stuck integrating over y, and y goes remember from minus one half b uh, to one half b. Okay, and this is what you're integrating. It's the same sort of thing. You get one-third y cubed here. We're going to bring the one-third out like that. And uh, so you've got your y cubed that needs to be evaluated from uh, minus one-half b to one-half b. And again, um, you know, y cubed is just like x cubed. It's an odd function, which means that when you plug in this bottom limit, the negative can be pulled out. You'll have something minus something, which will make it something plus something. You have a a one half b cubed uh, plus a one half b cubed, and what you end up getting here at the end of the day looks almost identical to this, except the a and the b are, are, are interchanged. You get sigma over twelve b cubed times a, which means that our moment of inertia looks like sigma over twelve uh, a cubed b plus sigma over twelve b cubed a. That's what you get when you add both these integrals together. But look, up here we have a relationship between sigma mass and the total area because we're given A, B, and M. We want to express it in that form at the end of the day. All right? So remember, sigma is the big M, the total mass, over A times B. So what I'm going to do is to pull the sigma over 12 out of both of these before I put that in. You have a cubed b plus b cubed a. That's what's left. And now when I plug in the sigma, I get big M over a times b times 12. a cubed b plus b cubed a. Now look, I'm dividing both of these terms by a times b. When it hits this term, this b is going to kill this b off and make this a square. When it gets under here, the A is going to kill that off, and the B is going to make that a square, which means that um, at the end of the day, your moment of inertia is going to look like um, 1 12th M times A squared plus B squared. And if I were to take and snag this, And then go over here and paste it. Look at 
Look at that. It's the same thing. Now, so so that said, um, let me step back here, and I'm not going to do the calculation. I just want to talk about it. We're going to do some uh, some actual problems here in a moment. But let me talk about the problem of the sphere, just to give you a sense of what I mean when I say that the moment of inertia is a relatively new concept. So what I'm going to do is to draw um, our coordinate system here uh, like this. And, you know, uh, we're going to assume that we have some axis that goes through the center that it's rotating about. Uh, in this particular case, I want this to be the axis. Okay. So we'll say this is the z-axis, this would be the y-axis, and you know the x-axis was come straight out of So we actually have substance of this three-dimensional object. Now look, this right here is not the R we're interested in. This is not the R that tells us about the distribution of our mass from the point of rotation. And the reason why is because it tells us our distribution of mass about the origin, not the z-axis. So this right here though, this, this is the distance that the mass is away from the axis of rotation. And this would be the r that would go into our integral when we do our calculation. So you would need to parameterize this in terms of the things that you normally integrate over. And in spherical coordinates, which is where you would work this, that would be over theta, which is the angle with respect to the z-axis, okay, r, and then coming out of here with respect to, uh, to x, rather, here, uh, would be phi, okay? Now, r here is actually pretty easy to parameterize, as you can see, just using basic, you know, trig, um, uh -oh. This R, and uh, we're using R for, to mean two different things here, so it's a bit problem. So what, let, me, let me do it this way. I'm going to call this Rho. This is Rho, like that. Rho here would equal to R times sine of theta. If you think about your trig, that's the opposite side. And this is what would go into our R squared dm. Okay, dm is easy. Um, it's just uh, a volume integral for uh, uh, what in this case would be spherical polar coordinates, which we don't want to deal with right now. So that said, um, let's actually start looking at some problems now. So let me scroll down over here. And uh, the first problem I'd like to take a look at is a simple kinetic energy problem. You have a sphere that has a mass of 5 kilograms, and it rotates with an angular speed of 50 RPM. If the radius of the sphere is 1 meter, what's its kinetic energy? So we're going to assume, um, given lack of information, that when this thing rotates, it rotates about an axis that goes straight down through the center, like this. Okay. So... This will say will be the direction of its angular velocity. We're given the following information. Um, the sphere has a mass of five kilograms. We also know that it rotates at 50 RPM. Now we're gonna need to convert this to radians per second. Um, we're also given a radius of the sphere uh, it's 1.0 meters. Now, there's something else we're given, too, and that's the fact that this is a sphere. So, as it rotates, the characteristics of its rotation are in part going to be defined by its moment of inertia. So, since we know that it's a sphere, and we're assuming that it rotates on an axis that goes through the center of it, we can go over here and pick the moment of inertia off of our, our little plot right here, our graph, uh, or our table rather. Uh, and it's 2 fifths mr squared. So here, I know that i is going to be 2 fifths mr squared. Now what do I want to find? Well, um, I want to find k sub theta. 
I want to find the angular kinetic energy. Okay. Now, um, well, that's pretty easy. You know, uh, case of theta is one half I omega squared. It has the same form, remember, as kinetic energy for translation. The only thing we really need to do is to handle this omega right here. Now, remember, um, one revolution is the same thing as two pi radians. <coughs> Likewise, this is per minute. And we know that for every one minute, there are 60 seconds. So this should cancel out the revolutions. This will cancel out the minutes. And this should give us radians per second. And if I put this in my calculator, I get... Five point two four radians per second. Now, so everything seems to be in the right system. If I take and I plug in the form of I here into our equation for kinetic energy. I can cancel out the twos. So the kinetic energy would be one fifth m r squared omega squared, or one fifth, the mass is five kilograms, r is one meter. You have to square that. And then you have omega squared. So when I do this, I get 27.4 joules. Or keeping in sig figs, two sig figs here, two here, but one here. So about 30 joules. So that's how much energy is trapped in a rotation. Now, so that said, um, what I'd like to do is to see how the characteristic of rotation affects what we've done in the past. So I'd like to think of a, an object. Um, we're going to look at a sphere, a cylinder, and a hoop, and also just, you know, a standard problem, uh, starting from rest up an inclined plane. And using energy arguments like we've done in the past, what I'd like to do is to find out what the velocity of each one of these objects would be when it gets to the bottom of an incline, assuming that they all roll without slipping. Okay, now if they slip when they roll, uh, all bets are off. Uh, we need to know a relationship between the way that they rotate and the way that they go down the incline. So here's our incline right here. This is theta. Theta is 45 degrees. Okay. Now, we're starting our objects a distance, which I'll call D, of one and a half meters up the incline. Now, spheres, cylinders, and hoops are all, if you look at them on edge, um, they all have a sort of a circular shape. So uh, I'll represent all three kind of like this. Whoops. Now, um, the radius of all of them is going to be the same, 25 centimeters. The masses are all the same, 1.0 kilograms. All right. So what I have been given is the following. My angle is 45 degrees. The distance up the incline that I'm starting is one and a half meters. The mass of all of my objects, 1.0 kilograms, and the radius of my objects when they go down is 25 centimeters, which we know is 0 0.25 meters. 
I'm also given the fact that I have a sphere, a cylinder, a hoop, and then I'm just going to look at the problem without assuming any sort of internal structure. So let me actually clean this up just a touch. That. A cylinder, a hoop, and a sphere. Well, let's take a look at our, uh, our stuff over here. Here's a hoop. A hoop that rolls is going to go around a central axis like this. So the moment of inertia of a hoop is mr squared. Okay. Now what about a cylinder? Again, let's go look at our plot here. Um, here's a solid cylinder rotating around a center axis or central axis. I is one half mr squared. And the sphere we've already looked at, that was here, two fifths of R squared. Now, no structure means that we're not taking into account the fact that it could roll, and at that point it's just going to slide down the incline, like many of the problems that we've worked in the past. Now, that said, uh, I'd like to actually start with the no structure one first, and then take a look at the sphere, the cylinder, and the hoop. So, um, in part, the reason why I want to do this is to just sort of outline how we're going to attack the problem. So here is uh, for part D first, like I said. So this is part D. Um, this thing is going to start, we'll say, here, a distance of d, which is one half meters up the incline. Now, I want to use energy arguments to solve this problem. So what I need to know, since this thing is falling down the incline due to gravity, is I need to know its height above the ground. Now, that's pretty easy to find out. Okay, we're going to call this h. And using uh, what I have here, h is going to equal to d times sine of theta. Okay? Now, so, at the top, if you think about your mass sliding down, at the top, the energy that it has, since it starts with, where it starts from rest, okay, we're going to assume that these things start from rest, which I guess is an additional bit of information that we can put here. Our initial energy is going to be kinetic energy plus potential energy. But if it's not moving, no kinetic energy, which means here the potential energy is simply that due to gravity, which is m times g times h, this being h. At the bottom, when it gets here and it's sliding this way, we're assuming that there is no more potential to move beyond the ground. So that goes away, and this is just 1 half mv squared. And as we've done so many times before, mgh is equal to 1 half mv squared. That is, the energy at the top is equal to the energy at the bottom. The mass is cancel. v is going to equal to the square root of 2 times g times h, or the square root of 2 times g times d sine of theta. Now, this is a result that we've seen a million times before. Let's just plug our stuff in. D was one and a half meters. And this is sine of 45. <clears throat> so, if I plug this into my calculator... Sine of 45, I get 4.56 meters per second. Now, this is something that I want to kind of keep up over here. Uh, and I want to point out that this is with no structure. 
no structure. So it's not rolling or anything like that when it goes down. And let's box it. And uh, we're going to compare the other three to this, but we already have our answer for part D. So now let's start with part A. Okay, part A is a sphere. We have the moment of inertia of the sphere right here. And um, we're going to use A to sort of be the template for B and C. And you'll see why here in a moment. So for A, we have the same sort of thing here. So let me just sort of steal it. Uh, I am going to clean it up, though, because um, I don't want to address this quite yet. This is important to us, but we need to have a conversation about the energy arguments here. And now um, we have a sphere sitting at the top at rest. Okay. Yep. It has a radius and a mass. Okay. Now, at the very top, the energy that we have initially, which would be a combination of any kinetic energy that we have, rotation or translational, and our beginning potential energy is only in potential because it's not rolling and it's not going down the center or going down the, uh, the incline. All right. So once again, that's going to be MGH with H being this. At the bottom, though, things are a little different because now you have kinetic energy and you have potential energy. Potential energy we know is zero because it can't move past the bottom. But our kinetic energy is in translation and it's in rotation. Okay. Some of the energy is making it roll. Some of the energy is making the center go down, which is where the V is. Now, so our conservation of energy says that this is equal to this. Before I go any further, I want to remind you that what we're, what we're trying to find is the velocity of these things as they go down, or as they get to the bottom, rather. So... We're trying to find this V, but this V is also tied up inside omega since this thing is rolling without slipping. Remember the example that we did last time um, where we had a wheel rolling without slipping. The velocity of the center is also the same as the tangential velocity and magnitude. And we know that V is equal to R times omega, which means omega is equal to V over R. We're going to put that in here. And now we have a way we can solve explicitly for V. Because there's a V squared here and a V squared here, and we can just pull it out. Okay. So let's do a little bit of uh, algebraic manipulation here. MGH on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side. We have a one half m plus one half i over r squared times v squared. All I did was to pull the v squared out to the right side, right hand side rather. So v squared is going to equal to mgh divided by one half times m plus i over r squared. I can flip the half up to the top, and in fact, I'm going to do that right now. When I do that, the half becomes a 2 at the top. 
And if you were to sort of ignore this part right here, if you were to take I away, just like we did in the previous uh, you know, part D, then the masses would cancel and you would get V is equal to the square root of 2 times G times H. So let's go ahead and solve for V. I'm going to put in parentheses like this. Okay, now this result is going to be true for the sphere, the hoop, the cylinder. Okay, it has the same form. The only thing that changes is the, is the object. And as a consequence, the moment of inertia. So for part A, V is equal to 2MGH. Well, actually, let me go ahead and put an H for what it is. D times sine of theta divided by m plus, now what's i? i for a sphere, which is the first part, is 2 fifths mr squared. 2 fifths mr squared over r squared. That's here in the denominator. Now look. This has a mass in it, this has a mass in it, and there's a mass here. They cancel, making this 1, and that goes away. There's an r squared here and an r squared here, which means what I have here is 2gd sine theta on the top and 1 plus 2 fifths on the bottom. Well, 1 is 5 fifths. 5 plus 2 is 7. This is 7 fifths in the denominator. When you flip it up to the top, the 5 hits the 2 and becomes 10. 10 sevenths. So let's plug some numbers in. So when you do this, you get go here. I get three point eight five meters per second. All right, so 3.85 for a sphere, or if you don't assume any structure at all, 4.56. Well, that's interesting. You're actually moving uh, less quickly. Well, why is that? Well, the answer is pretty easy to understand. Before, when we looked at objects that just you know, were points, uh, we didn't have to take into account the fact that they rolled as well. So what that means is, is when you take into account rolling, you're losing some energy to the fact that it's rolling. Okay, so some of that energy goes into moving the mass this way, but some of it also goes into rotating the mass as well. And as a consequence, your velocity at the end of the day is going to be less than it would be if you just thought of the object as a little point in space that didn't have any, any internal structure to it. Now, we can do B and C very easily just by denote or just by noting, you know, what their moments of inertia are. So for B, you're dealing with a cylinder. It's the same problem, except now the I is changed here. So for B, the I for a cylinder is one-half mR squared. So my velocity at the bottom would be 2 m gd sine of theta on the top 
divided by m plus one half m r squared over r squared. So the same thing here. The m's cancel, making this a 1. The r squareds cancel, making this in the denominator 1 plus 1 half. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. When you flip it to the top, it becomes 2 thirds. 2 times 2 is 4, so this would be 4 thirds gd sine theta. Okay. Same thing as before. And when you do this, you get let me put it in here. Three point seven two. So why would a cylinder go down and have a velocity that's a little bit less than that of a sphere? Well, if you look at the moment of inertia of a sphere, which is two fifths, and you look at the moment of inertia of a hoop, or rather a cylinder, which is one half, well, which number is bigger? I mean, think about it. You know, two fifths is 0.4. One half is 0.5. So what that means is, is that the the cylinder as it rolls down acts like it has a bigger moment of inertia, or it has more mass from a rotational standpoint, than the sphere does. And what that means is, is that it takes more energy or it holds more energy in its rotation than the sphere does. And as a consequence, your velocity at the end of the day is going to be less. Now, what about part C? Well, part C, you're dealing with a hoop, okay? And the moment of inertia of a hoop is mR squared. Again, exactly the same thing. In fact, you can kind of take a look at it already and see what's going to happen. Okay. Two-fifths was in front of the sphere, and there's a two-fifths here. One-half was in front of the eye for um, a cylinder. That's what you have here. Here it's one in front. One plus one is two. Two divided by two is one, which means doing the math this is just the square root of g times d times sine of 45. So, if I do that, this in here. I get 3.22. So even less. And again, you can see why. And that's because, you know, sitting out in front is a one. And one is greater than both of these. Okay. So more energy and rotation. Than here, this has more energy in rotation than here, and when you don't take into rotation at all, then or rotation into account at all rather, um, you know you get a maximum speed. So you can see when you start to add in the correct structure, the behavior of what's going on, things change a bit. Okay. Okay. So in this example, we're going to look at um, what happens when you actually add in uh, structure and you take into consideration rotation when you have a pendulum, okay? Now, so 
here we have a thin rod that has a mass uh, of 30 grams and a length of, I don't know why this says grams, it should be centimeters. I was just really excited about writing G's, I guess. <clears throat> With a small mass of 50 grams attached to the end. If the rod is raised 10 centimeters above the ground and released from rest, what is the velocity of the pendulum when it crosses the equilibrium position? Compare this to a massless rod pendulum. Okay, so, so basically, what I want to do is to compare this with structure to a pendulum that instead of having just 30 grams sitting on the end or 50 grams sitting on the end, it's got both of these. Okay, so we'll start by solving the one without structure. So let's uh, just sort of uh, fill in our picture here. Uh, I'm going to call the length of the rod L. Uh, it is 25 centimeters. Now, the mass on the end, I'm going to call M1. Uh, and um, its mass is 50 grams. The rod itself, I'll call M2. And its mass is 30 grams. Okay. Now, it says it's raised 10 centimeters above the ground and released from rest. That 10 centimeters would be this right here. It's not the best line in the world. Here we go. Like that. So, this is 10 centimeters. We'll call it H. Okay. And uh, basically, uh, what we're interested in is what the velocity is when this thing crosses the center point. Okay. Now, um, this is basically just a simple energy problem, all right? Because uh, we know at the top right here, uh, the energy initially is going to be a combination, whoops, is going to be a combination of kinetic energy and potential energy. But it's not moving because it says that it's released from rest. So at the top, what we expect, and we'll write our givens out here in a second, is, uh, you know, it's going to be, I'll call it mass of the pendulum times G times H. So that's going to be the energy that's in the system, okay? When it crosses the point over here at equilibrium, our energy is going to be a combination of kinetic energy and potential energy. But it can't move past the ground, which means there's no potential energy, which means that it's simply one half of V squared. All right. So, um, or M sub P rather V squared. So, so these energies are equal. All right. Uh, so for a, um, massless rod type pendulum, what you would have would be M sub P G H is equal to one half m sub p v squared. The mass is cancel because gravity is doing the moving here. And the velocity is just what you expect, square root of two times g times h. And here uh, h is 10 centimeters or is, you know, 0 0.10 meters. So, um, so in this case, nine point eight times point one. When it crosses the equilibrium position, um, it would be one point four meters per second would be the speed this traveling at. So what I'm going to put up over here just to keep track of it is the velocity of the massless. is 1.4 meters per second okay now so let me clear my work area here because um we're going to need some space just to sort of argue out what's going to happen <clears throat> so 
when you add structure into it, now we're looking at it from a rotational standpoint. All right. And even though this mass is moving through space, really what it's doing is it's rotating about this point right here. Okay, so this is your point of rotation. So what I'm going to do here is to put a theta here, which we uh, may or may not need. All right. Uh, and um, let's just write out what we've been given. So um, M1, which is the mass on the end, is 50 grams or uh, 0 0.05 kilograms. M2, which is the uh, mass of the rod, it's a thin rod, is uh, 30 grams, which is 0 0.03 kilograms. The length of the rod is 25 centimeters, or a quarter of a meter. It starts and I'm going to call this H1 because it's the position of mass 1. It starts um, 10 centimeters above the ground. All right. And we know it starts from rest. Now, what we want to find here is the velocity of the system when it crosses this equilibrium position right there. Now, so let me sort of uh, explain uh, what we have here. So um, when we release this thing from rest, really the best way to think about it is that you have two things that are connected. They're composite objects. Now, we know when you deal with um, stuff up to the point to where we talked about the moment of inertia, if you have masses uh, which we know is basically the same thing as inertia. All you do is add them. For example, uh, previously, um, you know, the mass of that pendulum would have been M1 plus M2, but we didn't need it because, you know, gravity was doing, doing its job. Um, when it comes to moments of inertia, you can add them, but you have to add them based off of the points of rotation. Okay. So, for example, here, we're talking about a rod of length 25 centimeters that's rotating around an endpoint. And here we have a mass you can think of being attached to a massless rod at the end, 25 meters or 25 centimeters away from the point of rotation. Okay. So that said, remember when you add in structure, the thing that, that follows the parabola when you fire it through the air is the center of mass. So if you look at this rod right here, this rod in truth by itself is not being released from 10 centimeters above the ground. It's being released from wherever its center of mass is. And since this is a uniform massless rod, it would be halfway up. So it would be dead in center. Kind of like when you balance a pencil on your finger, the balance point's about the center of the pencil. Okay, here it's going to be the center because it's a uniform massless rod. So we're going to have to find how high above the ground that is because that's going to be the potential energy that the rod has whenever it's released. And then you'll have the potential energy of this mass, which, you know, sits 10 centimeters above the ground. We already know that. So that's H1, like I said, but we're going to have to find an H2 here. So what I'm going to do to sort of um, clean things up here a touch is to take all the information that I've been given here. We're going to copy it. And then I'm going to add it to a new sheet. Okay, so there's my givens. I'm going to put that over here for a moment. And then what I'm going to do is to take this here. I'm going to move it over here and I'm going to blow it up. Wow, that's weird. I didn't take it. Oh, I know why. Here you go. That's better. Okay, so... Let me just sort of expand this a little bit so we have something I can write on pretty well. Now let's do a little bit of cleaning up. Um, I'll just do it with this. Uh, this looks pretty good. Although what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate a lot of the numbers here just to make my life easy. Because we already have them over here on the right. So um, 
remember we're going to call the mass here at the bottom just m1 uh, the mass of the rod was m2 this is theta this is our axis of rotation which would be out of the screen towards you um, the rod is has a length of l and at the halfway point right here this right here is one half l so we're going to have two heights here that we have to take into consideration this height right here which we'll need to find and this height right here which we already know so i'm going to call this h2 because it's related to the mass 2 and again this is h1 so how do you find h2 well we're kind of already given some information here about that you know that if you were to take and you were to let this thing swing all the way down to the bottom, it would basically touch the ground. So we've brought this thing up to the point to where it is, um, you know, uh, basically, let's see if the best way I can describe this is this distance right here. This distance right here would be L minus H1. Okay, because as drawn, when this thing crosses equilibrium at this point, this distance right here would be L. Okay, so, so what we basically have here is we know the hypotenuse length. We know the length of the adjacent side. Okay, so we can easily find, you know, um, uh, basically... Uh, how high above the ground this is. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's do that. Um, so, let me just sort of draw this thing out. Sit so down here. You'll see how this works. So, it's a little complicated, but it's not too bad. But again, this is what you have to do when you add structure in. It complicates things. So this side right here is L minus H1, and this side right here is L. So um, we know uh, that this side is related to the hypotenuse of the angle through a cosine. So um, that means that um, L cosine of theta would equal to L minus H1. Okay. Or uh, our angle is going to be... Uh, the arc cosine of L minus H1 over L. So let's just go ahead and find out what that is. So uh, L was uh, 0 0.25 uh, meters. H1 is 0 0.1 meters. And then we're dividing by 0 0.25 meters like this. <clears throat> Let me make sure my calculator is in degree mode. Good, it is. So what I have here is an angle that looks like... Uh, 53.13 degrees. I'm going to put this up here in my givens. So to be clear, this is the angle that's released at. So um, so knowing that, um, and again, let me let me clear some work area here. Knowing that, now let's do the smaller triangle because we need to find the h above the ground. So if we can find this length right here, okay, whatever that is. This is the height above the ground. This is H2. Okay. So we find this. We subtract that away from L. And that gives us this. All right. So now that triangle that we're dealing with looks like this. It's the same angle. And now the hypotenuse is L over 2. So I'm going to call this right here. Um, it's the best way to describe it. Uh, I'll call it D. All right, so this is D right here. Uh, this is L over 2. 
So if I want to find D, again, it's the relationship here is a cosine. So um, L over 2 times cosine of theta is going to equal to D, which um, we could express fully here, or we can just note that on the side. All right. I prefer to uh, actually work with the equation, but um, for the sake of curiosity, let's uh, let's figure out what it is. So uh, L is 0 0.25 meters. Divide that by two, and then you got cosine of uh, 53.13 degrees. So let's see here. I get uh, 0 0.075. Okay, so, so now we have D, which is convenient. So let's just uh, put that here. We'll get rid of this. So we haven't really had, we're just doing geometry games right now. We haven't even started the physics yet, but that's okay. Okay, so, so this distance right here, H2, uh, is what you get when you take L and you subtract away D. Okay, so we'll keep note of that over here since we have L and D. So, so this is the thing, this is the height above the ground or where the potential energy would be for, uh, for mass two, basically. So this is where you would, you would take into consideration the initial uh, potential energy of the second one. And just like before, this is where uh, the initial potential energy is for the first one. So now let's talk about shapes because you have a thin cylinder or a, th a thin rod rather um, that's uh, rotating about an axis on the end. So if you were to go up to, let's see, where is it at? It's up over here and look at shapes and stuff. You have a thin rod about an axis through the center, which is not what we're dealing with. But here you have a thin rod about the axis through one end right here. So this is what we're looking at. And uh, I is one third MR squared. R being the length of the rod. So back down over here. So our I for the rod is one third, whoops. See a third but a half. The mass of the rod, which is M2, and the length of the, the rod as it rotates, uh, which is L. So there's your I. Okay. Now we can handle um, M1 two ways. We can either find I, um, you know, assuming the length of a rod going around um, that's massless. Or, um, you know, we can uh, note the fact that as it, as it rotates, R here is L, and it's going around. Um, and we can do, so we can do our kinetic, I guess what I'm trying to say is we can do our kinetic energy either strictly rotationally or strictly translationally. But if it's translating, it's still going around in a circle. So it turns into rotational kinetic energy either way. So what I propose to do is to just go ahead and find I for um, the mass on the end. And so the system that we would be looking at there would be something like this. Um, you have a mass uh, M1 that sits a distance of L away from a point of rotation. So there's our center. Um, well, what's the best way to do this? Let's say it's rotating about that point. Here is M1. And this distance right here is L. So if you add up the masses times how far away they are from the point of rotation, you get I. So now you have a discrete uh, thing here. And this is just, you know, M1 times L squared. 
So we have I of the mass, which is M1L squared. All right. So um, now we found everything that we need to find. Let me clear my work area again. And I think what I am going to do also is to snipe some of this off the end so, so we don't need it. It's just useless to us right here. Plus taking up room. And uh, I'm going to relocate this there. Okay. So, um, so now uh, it, it's just a simple kinetic energy problem or potential energy problem. So uh, I'm going to call this location one. I'm going to call this location two. So at location one, which is where everything starts off, your initial energy would be the kinetic energy of the rod initially. Or actually, let's stick with letters or numbers here, rather. Kinetic energy of the rod, which would be 2, plus the kinetic energy of the mass initially, plus the potential energy of the rod initially, plus the potential energy of the mass initially. Now, they start from rest. That's 0. Um, so here, um, basically what you would have here would be m 1 g h1 plus m2 g h2 because remember it's the center of mass that makes the arc that's what we're looking at okay so um h1 we already know what that is uh let me just go ahead and plug in what h2 is over here L minus D. So that's uh, your energy at that point. Okay, so so now let's talk about location two. So you have energy there, which would be the kinetic energy of the mass plus the kinetic energy of the rod at that point, plus whatever potential energy they may have. Okay, now we know um, the bottom here marks zero for potential energy. So as this thing swings and gets to this point, the mass on the end is not going to have any potential energy. But if you look at the center of mass, whenever it swings and it arcs, when it stops here, at this point right here, it is one half L above the ground. So it still has potential energy there. Okay. So, so what that means is, is that whereas we can argue that this right here is zero, our final potential energy at the crossing point for the rod is definitely not. Now remember, it's the difference in potential energy between the release point and the point that you're interested in that drives the motion. And that's what this is doing. It's going to be the difference between these two potential energies that's going to motivate the rod, you could say. So if you think about that, what I'm going to do just to sort of be uh, notationally consistent here, I rod, so that since that's the second one, we're going to call that I2. The mass is number one. We're going to call that I1. So from a kinetic energy standpoint, you would have one half I1 omega squared plus one half I2 omega squared because they're both moving at the same angular speed. Okay, they're attached to each other. But then you have the potential energy from the rod that's left behind, which would be M2G times L over 2, because that's how high above the ground you are. Okay? So at the end of the day, we're going to find omega, and through finding omega, we'll be able to find you know um, the velocity of uh, not just the rod, but also the mass on the end. Uh, really, the mass is what we're interested in. So um, that said, let's go ahead and uh, set them equal to each other. So we have M1 G H1 plus M2 G L minus D. That's the initial energy. That's equal to one half I1 plus. Oh, huh. there we go. Let's fix that. I1 omega squared plus one half I2 omega squared. 
plus m2gl over 2. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is to move this over here to the left-hand side and then switch sides. Uh, you have on one side, 1 half i1 omega squared plus 1 half i2 omega squared. And that's going to equal 2 m1 g h1 plus m2 g l minus d minus l over 2. Now l minus d minus l over 2, if you look at that, you have l minus l over 2 here, which is just l over 2. Okay, so this really in here is going to be l over 2 minus d. Okay. Now, so, and it should make sense because if you look here, it's this little distance right here that's doing the motivate. This is this right here for the rod itself. This is this is the change in potential energy occurs between these two points in space. That's what's going to go straight to the kinetic energy for this. Okay, so uh, almost done here. Uh, on the left hand side, I see a one half and omega squared in common. So uh, remember, we want omega squared. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to sort of, as you can see, the moments of inertia add as long as they have the same point of rotation. Okay. And on the right-hand side, you have M1 GH1 plus uh, M2 G times L over 2 minus D. So uh, let's go ahead and solve for uh, omega. Excuse me. Um, okay, so that's omega squared. Uh, before we uh, square root things, let's just go ahead and see what's going to happen when we put I1 and I2 in there. Now, here's our I1 and our I2 right here. So, um, so here, I1 is M1 L squared. Um, I2 is one third M2 L squared. So there's some common terms here. This one half we can flip up to the top and make it a two if we want. And then in the denominator we'll have uh, an L squared sitting there. So um, our omega. You know, this is a huge square root here. You have that in the numerator. And then in the denominator, you have M1 plus one third of M2. And this is raised to the one half power square root. So um, if I plug my numbers in, and let me, uh, it's the easiest way to do this. I think it's going to just be the snag again. We just need the numbers. There we go. So let's plug stuff in. I have two times. We have um, M1 G H1. Um, I guess I could pull the G out if I wanted to, huh? 
I'll tell you what, let's, let's just go ahead and amend that here just to make this less writing. So what I'm going to do is to clean this up just a little bit. There. Yeah, a little cleaner or more clean rather. Okay, so um, this would be 2 times G times H, which is what we would expect in the, the numerator, just like when we had done the solution to find out what the velocity of, um, you know, that, that single mass that it uh, had crossed was, okay, uh, without structure. So 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, M1 is uh, 0 0.05 kilograms. Um, then we have H1. H1 is 0 0.1 meters plus M2. M2 is 0 0.03 kilograms. And then you have L over 2 minus D. That would be 0 0.25 meters divided 2 by 2 rather minus d, and d is uh, 0 0.075 meters. All right. Um, and that's in the numerator. Now in the denominator, we have an L squared. Then we have an M1. and one-third of an M2. So what do you get here? Well, let's see. Um, 2 times 9.8 times, let's see, we have 0 0.05 times 0.1 plus 0 0.03 times 0.25 divided by 2 minus 0 0.075. All right, so that's that. Let me close the parenthesis there. And that should be the numerator. And then the denominator is 0.25 squared times 0 0.05 plus one third of 0 0.03, which is a pretty easy one, I guess. Uh, let me make sure that's closed. All right, now let's take the square root of that. I get 5.83 radians per second. Now, so, so when we work the problem originally, and let me go back to this other page over here where we actually have the velocity. What we were looking at was the velocity of this mass on the end when it crossed the end point, or across this uh, equilibrium position, rather. So this is what we got. So let me copy that, and we're going to compare that because we're going to actually calculate what V is because it's just the tangent to velocity, right? So let's uh, copy that, and then I'm going to go over here, and we'll paste it. Oops. Of course, it's going to be like that, right? So let me paste it here. So this is what you get when you don't take into account any sort of internal structure. So here... The tangential velocity would be r times omega, and r would be the point that you're interested at. And the point we're interested at is here at the end when it crosses. So at the end, that's L times omega. All right. So um, 0 0.25 meters times 5.83 radians per second. So you get.
1.46 meters per second. Okay. So the other one, um, what I'll do is I'll string a few digits out over here. Uh, let's see. The other one would have been... just strictly 1.4. So what's happened here is that it's actually moving a little faster and it's moving a little faster because you have this additional uh, potential energy. Okay. So you've got the additional potential energy uh, here motivating this rod and that's being added into this as well. So when you add in, uh, you know, reality to the situation, things have changed. Right. So um, are all energy problems that deal with rotational motion like this? No. Um, you know, this was this was not too bad, but it was a little messy. Uh, some of them can be pretty easy. So uh, what I want to do next video is to talk about the uh, last quote unquote big subject, uh, which is uh, the force analog for rotation. So we've we've talked about kinetic energy. Uh, we've done lots of examples. We've talked about what the equivalent of inertia is, like what the equivalent of mass is with respect to rotations. So uh, next one, we're going to talk about torque, which is the rotational analog of force. And given torque, we can talk about work, which will give us a work energy theorem for rotations. And I will see you then.